Okay, so last time on Tuesday, we talked about solutions and making solutions. We talked about inter intermolecular forces, and we ended talking about mass percent. Today, we're going to put a couple more pieces into that, and then we'll be, we'll be, that'll be all the stuff that's on the exam on Tuesday, or the end of all the stuff on the exam on Tuesday. So, um, the, the mass percent is a fine way of measuring con concentration. But in chemistry, we often want something that has to do with moles. So we use molarity. And some of you got a chance to calculate this on Tuesday in lab, if you were going on and finish, trying to finish the calculations in, in uh, Tuesday's lab. Molarity is another type of a concentration, which means it's, if we go back and remember this, it means it's an amount of solute divided by an amount of solution. Mass percent was grams over grams, grams of solute, grams of solution, or pounds of solute, pounds of solution. Molarity is which is a capital M moles of solute over liters of solution. So it's still an amount of solute over an amount of solution, but this time the amount of solute is in moles and the amount of solution is in liters. So to calculate the molarity of a, a solution, you need to know how many moles you're putting in and what the total volume of that solution is. All right, so let's look at an example. What is the molarity when 15 grams of sodium chloride are dissolved? I'm um, not in, sorry. Two. to make 100 milliliters of solution. What's the molarity when 15 grams of sodium chloride are dissolved to make 100 milliliters of solution? So to figure this out, it's just like any other uh, concentration measurement. You're going to divide solute by solution, amount of solute by amount of solution. The difference here is because we're asked specifically for molarity, that tells us that it need, our final answer needs to be moles on top divided by liters on the bottom. So we look at the units that we're given, and we may have to convert them to do that. So we're given 15 grams of sodium chloride, which is not moles, and we're given 100 milliliters of solution, which is not liters. That means this part is going to have to get converted to moles, and this part, part is going to have to get converted to liters. And then, when we convert those two, we can divide them. So we've done those conversions before. Fifteen grams of sodium chloride, we can convert grams to moles by using the molar mass. So that's 23 for sodium and 35.5 for chlorine. So that's 58.5. 15 divided by 58.5. And that's moles of NaCl. Okay, so that's not molarity yet. That's just the number of moles of NaCl, 15 grams. We also have to convert the milliliters to liters. 100 milliliters 
And we know to go from milliliters to liters, there's a thousand milliliters in a liter. So that's gonna be 0 0.1 liters. Now we have moles and liters, and so we can calculate molarity. So the molarity is going to be our moles, 0.26 moles, divided by our volume of solution, 0.1 liter. And that is 2.6. And the way we write that is with a capital M, and we say molar, like your tooth. So we would say the solution is 2.6 molar NaCl. All right, so moles divided by liters is molarity. But usually that's not how we go about using molarity. We don't just have some random amount of sodium chloride or solute, and we put it in some amount and, and calculate the molarity. It happens sometimes, but not a lot. Usually it's more like, okay, we're doing a reaction, and we want to have a certain number of moles of this reactant. So how much solution do we need to make that happen? So that might look like this. How many milliliters of a um, let's say two point six molar and actually I'm gonna change this because it's usually not written molar out, out like that. Usually you just get a big capital M. So how many milliliters of a 2.6 molar NaCl solution contain three point two moles? Okay. So we've done some kind of calculation with an equation, and we know we need three point two moles of NaCl. We look on the shelf, there's a 2.6 molar solution. How much of that solution do we need to get those 3.2 moles of NaCl? This type of a problem is, is easier, I think, because it's a conversion type problem. We can think of molarity, remember, as moles per liter. So 2.6 molar tells us that there are 2.6 moles of NaCl in each liter of this solution. It tells us that. That's what that number tells us. No calculations or anything. Just tells us 2.6 moles per liter. So you can think of that as a way of relating moles and liters in the solution. So then we can think about this problem as converting 3.2 moles to milliliters via liters. So we're going to convert from moles to liters using the molarity and then get that in milliliters. So let's try it. So we want 3.2 moles of NaCl. So we're going to multiply that by a factor that relates moles of NaCl and liters of solution. And then we're going to convert that to milliliters by going from liters to milliliters. So that's a standard conversion type problem. Now we need to fill in the numbers. So we know there's 1,000 milliliters per liter. And then the other numbers come from the molarity. The molarity 2.6 molar tells us that there are 2.6 moles per each liter. So we can evaluate that. 3.2 divided by 2.6 times 1,000. One thousand two hundred and thirty 
one milliliters. All right, so we'd need 1,231 milliliters of the solution to get 3.2 moles. That makes sense. If it's 2.6 molar, that means there's 2.6 moles in each liter. So if we want 3.2 moles, that's a little bit more than that. So we got a little bit more than a liter. No, that's just a number that we picked out. There's one, you know, you can make your solution any number you wanted, depending on the solubility. All right, so let's number these because there's a couple of different ways of doing it. So first, you want to be able to do this type of a problem where you're given a mass and a volume and you find molarity. Second, you want to be able to do this kind of thing where you know, want to know how much of a given concentration solvent you need, or given concentration solution you need to give a certain amount of solute. And then the third way is we want to know how do we actually make these solutions. Let's use a different, a different uh, compound this time. Let's say we need 250 milliliters of a one molar NaOH, let's say 1.0 just so it doesn't look like L or something, a 1.0 molar NaOH solution. How do we make it? And the most important part of this question is, how many grams of NaOH do we need? So if you're going to make this solution, 250 milliliters of a one molar solution, you need to know how much sodium hydroxide do I need to get out of the jar, and then uh, how much do I put in the flask? And then I'm going to dilute that to 250 milliliters to make, to make 250 milliliter solution. Um, so to do this, again, we're going to treat it kind of like a conversion problem. We ultimately want our answer in grams. Okay. We can use our milliliters here and go, we're going to start with that 250 milliliters that we're given. From that, we can get liters. From liters, we can get moles using the molarity. And then from moles, we can get grams from the molar mass. Here's what that looks like. Two hundred and fifty milliliters times so we're gonna go milliliters to liters, liters to moles of NaOH, and then moles to grams. Okay, let's fill in those numbers. Thousand milliliters per liter. One mole of NaOH per liter, that comes from the molarity. So I guess it should really be 1.0, but that's not going to change our calculation. And then the final number is grams of NaOH per moles of NaOH. That's what we call the molar mass. So we add that up from the periodic table. 23 plus 16 plus 1 is 40. Two fifty divided by a thousand times forty is ten. That came out pretty nice. So the way that you would do this physically is 
you would take a 250 milliliter volumetric flask. We haven't used volumetric flasks yet. They look kind of like this. They have a skinny neck um, with kind of a bulb on the bottom. And they just have one line that goes around somewhere on the neck. And each volumetric flask is calibrated to one specific amount. And it'll say that on it. So this will say like 250 milliliters. Because remember, our molarity is moles of solute per liters of solution. So that doesn't mean mole, you take 10 grams of sodium hydroxide and you mix them with 250 milliliters of water. Because that, be, that would be volume of solvent, not volume of solution. If you want the volume of the whole solution, what you do is you put your 10 grams of sodium hydroxide in there, and then you fill it up with water until it gets just to that line. Once it's just to that line, you know you have 250 milliliters of total solution. You mix it up, and you're on your way with your one molar solution, your 250 milliliters of one molar NaOH. So that's how you prepare a solution like that. All right. So let's try this. How to do this. Yes, for Tuesday. How many grams of, let's say, copper 2 sulfate are needed to make 500 milliliters of a 2 molar? Solution. All right, so follow the same procedure as we did before. Give me some different numbers and see if you can get those numbers in there. The nice thing about these problems is they're pretty, um, there's not a lot of variation here. Like that problem has pretty much the same wording as the one before, which is what it's going to look like on the exam also. So there's not like a million different ways you can twist this around to uh, ask it. So give that a try.
All right, let's take a look at this one. So again, you set it up the same way. So your units are going to be starting from the 500 milliliters that you're given to liters, to moles of solute, and to grams. So milliliters to liters, liters to moles using the molarity, moles to grams using the uh, molecular weight or the molar mass. 1,000 milliliters in a liter. The concentration, again, tells us how many moles are in each liter. And then the molar mass we get from the periodic table. Did somebody calculate that for copper sulfate? What? 160. Does that sound right? Yes, okay. Oh, that's interesting. Oops. Does it just come out to 160? Oh, yeah, because the 500 divided by 1,000 is 2. Is, is a half, and times two is one, so then, yeah, 160. Okay, so it's just a weird coincidence. Well, not really weird. I guess if you want half of a liter of a two molar solution, there'd be one mole in there, so that makes sense. All right, so that's how you do that type of a problem. Okay, we're going to skip the other concentration measurements, they're not in the in the chapter objectives for this chapter. So you don't need to know, even though that we did them in the lab, you don't need to know how to do mass by volume or volume percent, percent by volume. Um, just percent by mass and molarity is what to focus on for this exam. All right, the last uh, part of the chapter just deals with some uh, descriptive stuff about some different names we call solutions and different types of interactions that are like solutions. That is, well, suspensions. And colloids. This has to do with particle size. So what we've been talking about is solutions. Those have the smallest particles. We know that the particles in a solution are molecules and ions. The very smallest bits get broken apart and surrounded by water. Sometimes they stay whole molecules, sometimes they break apart into ions, but they're very small. If those particles get bigger, we no longer have the same properties called the solution, the stuff we've been talking about. We kind of have some other stuff. So on the far end of the scale, the other end, we have what are called suspensions, which have much larger particle sizes. So now you're talking about things that are more like mixtures. Um, they have, well, the solution's a mixture too, but more heterogeneous. You have these large particles suspended in the water. Um, what's what's a main feature of a suspension? Have you, has anybody ever heard of something called a suspension, like a medicine or something like that? Yeah, amoxicillin, like that pink stuff that, that you get sometimes. Probably not anymore because you probably swallow up those now. But <laughs> when you were younger, you get that gross pink stuff. And what do you have to do before you drink it? 
you have to shake it, right? And that's because the particles in a suspension are so large that they will settle. They'll fall to the bottom if they're not shaken up. So in the middle of that, you have what are called colloids. which are not small enough particles to be a solution, but are too large, or, or too, the particles are too large to be a solution, but they don't settle out. So that's something like milk. Milk has large enough particles in it, um, fat particles and proteins and things, that you can't see through it, right? It's like white. But you can, if it's homogenized milk, if it sits in the fridge, it's still not gonna separate out because the particles have been broken up into really, really tiny pieces through that homogenization process. Um, so solutions usually look clear. You can see all the way through them really easily. Colloids usually look cloudy. Suspensions also look cloudy, but then they settle out to the bottom. And the, the, piece, the bits of them come down to the bottom. So that's how we define um, those things. If we look in the book, we can also define it by how to separate them. You know. Okay, I'm just gonna grab a picture so we don't have to draw our own confusing picture here. All right, so here we go. Whoa. Oh, there. So here's another way we can think about that based on how we separate them. So in this example, um, what you've got is a mixture. We're actually gonna do this in lab um, the week after the exam. You've got a mixture of st some stuff. Some of the particles are solution particles. Those are orange circles. Some of them are colloids. Those are uh, green triangles. And some of them are suspensions particles. Those are red squares. If you set those all together in, a, in some water or whatever, and you let it sit, the suspension particles, particles will settle down to the bottom. The other two will stay in solution, will stay suspended. If you filter them through a filter paper, like a coffee filter or something, same thing. The suspension particles get caught in the filter. Everything else makes its way through. The only way you can separate out uh, solution particles and colloidal particles is through something called a semi-permeable membrane. A semi-permeable membrane is a structure that has very, very fine um, porosity that essentially only single molecules can pass through. Only small molecules can pass through it. So examples of that would be um, well, the, the most important one is probably cell membranes in the body. Those are semi-permeable membranes. So the processes that bring things in and out of the cell are the same things that would go through there. There's also like things like plastic wrap or semi-permeable membranes. We're going to use some in that lab uh, in a couple weeks called dialysis tubing, which is a semi-permeable membrane. So it's a special material that can allow small molecules through, but colloidal particles will not go through that. Colloidal particles um, are things like proteins. So you know, um, egg proteins or milk proteins, that kind of stuff. Starches, starches are too big. They're, they're molecules, but they're too big of molecules, and they won't, they won't make it through um, that. So in this picture, it's not super easy to see, but in this picture, the solution and suspension particles, or I'm sorry, the solution particles are outside, have made their way through that membrane, but the suspension and the colloidal particles stay inside. So that's how you can separate those. To separate out a solution, you have to do it by something like a change of state. So you have to physically evaporate all the water off and then have, like you did in lab on Tuesday, and have those um, that sodium chloride or whatever left behind. Because it's so small of particles that you can't just filter it. All right. So that's the solution to the suspensions. While we're talking about semi-permeable membranes, let's talk about osmosis and osmotic pressure. Um, so has anybody here done the whole like physiology thing and 
talked about all this stuff before. So you can probably tell. So what's osmosis? What does that mean? What? No. Anybody want to give a shot? How do we define osmosis? Have you heard of it? So what is it? Something about water? Yeah, so that's it. Yeah, osmosis is the, yeah. Osmosis is the movement of water through a semi-permeable membrane. Um, and mostly we talk about that in the context of biological things. So we're talking about water going in and out of cells as osmosis. Um, it's kind of, that term has kind of been adopted by general use kind of culture stuff. And we talk about like learning things by osmosis, by like putting a book on your head or being close to smart people or something like that. Um, but really what it means is the movement of water through a semi-permeable membrane. So the reason that's a pressure is that there actually has to be a driving force to push that water through that membrane. Um, and it looks like this. Again, I'll get a picture from the book so we don't have to draw a terrible version of it. All right. So in this picture, what's going on here, if you look at the beaker on the left, it's split into two parts with a semi-permeable membrane. So that's like a cell membrane kind of thing. On the left is pure water. And on the right is water with sucrose or sugar dissolved in it. Because it's a semi-permeable membrane, water can go back and forth between the two sides. Because it's smaller than sucrose, it's going to go back and forth. What's going to happen here is, eventually, more water is going to end up on the right than on the left. And the reason for that is because of equalizing the concentration. When water goes over on the right, it enhances the intermolecular forces with the sucrose and kind of wants to stay there. And so more water gets pushed to the right as it tries to equalize the concentration. The ideal would be to have an equal concentration on each side. That's not going to happen here because there's no sucrose on the left, um, although eventually some of that will probably diffuse over also. So the water pushes from left to right. And over time, you would actually see the right side being higher up than the left side because some of this water has moved over to here. So overall, more water is moving right than moving left. It can go back and forth, but overall, it's going to be more going from left to right. And that's actually creating a pressure, because in order to raise the level of a liquid like that, it has to push up against the atmosphere. And so that, that we would say there's an osmotic pressure of that water pushing against that membrane to push that uh, region on the right upward against the atmospheric pressure. And that's what we call osmotic pressure. So this becomes very important inside the body, because if that you have this kind of difference in concentration, between the inside of the cell and the outside of the cell, then water is either going to go into the cell or go out of the cell through osmosis. And that could be good, but that could be bad. So what happens if you have this situation and we say that the left side is the outside of the cell and the right side is the inside of the cell, what's going to happen to that cell? If the outside has less solute in it than the inside. But anybody? So if water pushes into the into the cell, what happens eventually? It bursts open. Yeah. So if you have if you have a cell like something like a blood cell in your blood, and your blood does not have enough solute concentration, it's going to force water into the cell and eventually burst the cell open. So that could be a problem. The opposite of that, let's imagine the opposite situation. Now, you've got lots and lots of concentration of solute in the blood, and the cell doesn't have as much concentration. So what happens then? It shrinks up. Yeah, the water escapes from the cell, pushes outward. The osmotic pressure is going outward, away out of the cell, and eventually the cell could just shrivel up and not have enough water in it and die. So either way it can be a problem. 
And there are um, there are names for those situations. So let's again get some pictures from the book because I think it's easier if we see it rather than just talking about it. Here's some actual microscope pictures of some blood cells. Okay. So on the left, we have what's called an isotonic solution. Tonic is actually a, an old word for ions. So an isotonic solution means the same ions. And what it means is that the outside um, whatever that the cell is in, the blood, has the, the same uh, osmotic pressure as the in intracellular fluid inside the cell. So you've got the same solute concentration, and this is of all solutes. The water doesn't care if it's sugar or salt or whatever, all solutes. The concentration is the same, that's called isotonic, which means there's going to be just as much water moving in as moving out, and everything's going to stay balanced and normal and good. Does anybody know what the concentration of an isotonic solution is for the body? There's a couple different ways, depending on the solute that you're using. Um, isotonic is 0.9% sodium chloride. That's called normal saline sometimes. And that gives that standard, that standard osmotic pressure, so it's not going to mess with the cells, it's not going to pull water out of the cells, things like that. Um, you could also have a 5% glucose solution. The weight is different. The, the, these are both mass by volume. In either case, of any solute, a 0.3 molar solution of solute will always be isotonic. So whatever solute it is, if there are 0.3 moles of it per liter, you have an isotonic solution. Remember that moles is about counting, so individual particles. So it doesn't matter what the particle is. If there's 0.3 molar, it's going to be isotonic. All right, so if instead you have what's called a hypotonic solution, hypo means less and ionic, so that means a solution that has fewer ions, hypotonic, fewer ions, lower ions. That's more like the plain water, and the osmotic pressure is going to push that into the cell, which will eventually cause the cell to burst. So if you have less than a 0.9% sodium chloride, Like, for instance, if you tried to put pure water in there or something, you would be forcing water into the cells, which could eventually burst them. And uh, similarly, or oppositely, uh, if you have a hypertonic solution, you have more ions. So if you had a greater con con uh, concentration, you would have a hypertonic solution. Now you're drawing water out of the cells, which could eventually um, cause them to which is when they kind of shrivel up. So that's how osmosis can affect the, um, the cells by this water moving back and forth. All right. So water movement um, like that through a semipermeable membrane is called osmosis. There's another related phenomenon called dialysis, which is solution particles or solvated particles moving through the semipermeable membrane. And we'll see this uh, next week in lab, but the, uh, the idea is that if you have something like a dialysis membrane or whatever, that things like chloride, sodium, glucose, sucrose, other kinds of small molecules can diffuse through that as well. Sometimes uh, diffusion is the more general term, which refers to anything, water, and other stuff too. Um, dialysis is specifically referring to those solutes. So when we think of dialysis as like a machine or something that you need if your kidneys don't work, what's happening is that your blood is uh, going out to this machine, 
using these dialysis membranes, you use a special solution so that the waste stuff in the blood that you want to get rid of passes through the membrane to the other side um, and gets rid of it. And that's what that process does, and then gets pumped back in your body. So um, that's kind of the opposite, not really the opposite, but, but a different way of things moving through semi-permeable membranes. All right, so that is the end of chapter nine. The exam on Tuesday will cover chapters two through nine, except for the one we skipped, five, I think, the nuclear chemistry one, yeah. It will focus on all the stuff since the last exam, but you still need to know a lot of the earlier stuff to be able to do that, so things like naming and uh, unit conversions, things like that will still be on there but I won't just pull out some random question from chapter two or something. Um, it'll be in, in context. So make sure you can do things like mole conversions, balancing equations, writing down formulas for names, um, talking about gas relationships, uh, and then the solution stuff that we just talked about this week. So concentrations of solutions, molarity, mass percent, uh, all that good stuff. On Blackboard, there's some stuff to help you out, and I can I can put some more too. I don't think the solution stuff is up there yet, but just to remind you what's there. If you go into course materials, you've got the chapter objectives. That's a good place to start. Each topic tells you what you need to know, the problems you should work on. Just like with the first exam, a lot of the problems are going to be taken from um, the homework questions or very similar to that. So if you can go through and do all the homework questions, that's a good way to know that you're up on what you need to be able to do. We've also got all of our notes from class in there. Somewhere there. And there's some nice um, practice here. So like if you still need some practice with your equations and moles and things, there's a very large set of questions that you can go through. I printed off a different service um, that you can look at here. And there's a sheet with answers as well to check yourself. There's one for uh, unit conversions from chapter two and one for naming stuff also. So please go through those if, if, you, if you need some uh, extra practice. And I can post one for solutions too if you think that would be helpful um, to practice some of those calculations. I will be in um, my office after class today and then also tomorrow pretty much all day, nine to whatever it is, two I think. Um, so you come by if you have questions for me. Monday night, like with the last exam, I have a class Monday night here at 5.30, um, 5.30 to 8.15, and it's an open question period before the exam. So if you all can make it on Monday evenings, um, you're welcome to be here for that. We'll have, we're going to do a quiz at the beginning, so um, don't you won't be here for that one. But uh, if, you, if you come around 6 or something, we should be ready to go with questions. Uh, and then Tuesday for very, very last minute questions. We'll have our 12.30 class in here. Um, no new material, just whatever. And then we'll, like with the last time, we'll start whenever everybody's ready to start uh, the exam. All right, so happy studying. Send me messages if you have questions. And uh, yeah, hope everything goes well.